Welcome to the Up Close Podcast, your home for conversations about the present and future of public education. On this month's episode, we'll dive into one of the nation's most promising practices in the effort to bring the very best in public education to students nationwide, specifically a strategy called community schools. And here with me today to discuss how we can all come together as a community to support students and families is the wonderful Dr. Jane Quinn. Welcome, Jane. Thank you, Sarah. It's great to be here. And we are so privileged to have you with us. Everyone, let me tell you a little bit about Dr. Jane Quinn. Jane is a true visionary who, for more than four decades, has been improving the lives of children across the nation through research, policy, and program development, and philanthropy, all related to advancing the very best in public education, and particularly through community schools. Jane is considered one of the architects of the current community schools movement in this country, and accordingly, she has both directly and indirectly impacted the lives of millions of children across the world during a nearly 50-year career. I can share with you that I met Jane many years ago when I was considering how we might improve upon a philanthropy that I was with, wanted to improve upon an after-school initiative. And I learned about the community school's work at that time through Jane, and we subsequently went on in that area to develop robust community schools. So I am telling you, you are in for a treat today because this is someone who is very, very deeply knowledgeable about this field. But let me tell you also a little bit about her background. So Jane's national prominence came when she first was the national program director for the Girls Clubs of America. And it was during that time that she also served on a national commission that was led by the Carnegie Corporation in New York to determine the best reforms for middle grade education with a specific focus on out-of-school time learning. And that commitment led her to her first publication, which was entitled A Matter of Time, Risk and Opportunity in the Non-School Hours, which became a nationally recognized piece of research and one of my first go-to resources in doing this work. That work led to numerous changes throughout the country in the way folks were developing and implementing after-school and out-of-school time programs, leading to numerous changes in after-school and out-of-school time programs across the country. And so Jane, Jane's work with the girls' clubs and the Carnegie Corporation led her to the Wallace Foundation, where she served as its program director for seven years until she was named Vice President for Community Schools at the Children's Aid Society in New York and the director of its National Center for Community Schools, which has played a pivotal role in the development of community schools throughout New York City. Jane has been a regular contributor to Youth Today since 2000, writing more than 30 opinion pieces on several topics, and she has just completed new doctoral studies at the City University of New York. Wow, that is quite an introduction, Jane, but only because you are so accomplished. And we, again, are so grateful to have you with us today. And I've promised the audience that today we're going to talk about community schools. But I also recognize that not everyone is familiar with the community school strategy. So as we start, Jane, would you just share a little bit about what are community schools and why are you so committed to the furtherance of this strategy throughout the nation? Sure, I'd be happy to talk about that. And I love it that you're talking about community schools as a strategy because that's exactly how I have come to think of it as well. And so my favorite definition is that community schools are a strategy for organizing school and community resources around student success. Mm. And I think it's really important to start there, you know, that community schools know their students and families well, and they make a point of partnering in a strategic way with local resource organizations 
that can respond to the strengths and needs of the children and families in that school. Mm -hmm. I'm a strong proponent, as you say, because I have seen firsthand that this strategy works. And you're writing a book about it right now, if I can let the cat out of the bag there a little bit. And and yet you've been at this work for quite some time. So why now? What Why write this book at this particular moment in time, Jane? I am writing a book with several colleagues, Marty Blank, Ira Harkavy, Lisa Villarreal, and David Goodman. And we have taken on this task because we believe the community schools work is at a pivotal point after 25 years of incubation, development, expansion, and evaluation. This group got together because some people think of us, me, Ira, Marty, and Lisa, as the elders of the community (laughs) schools field. I embrace that identity. And we are writing this book because We believe that community schools are both doable and worth doing. We chose to tell the story of the development of community schools across the country through the lens of seven mature community school initiatives, places that you know, Sarah, Albuquerque, Cincinnati, the state of Florida, Mm. Los Angeles, New York City, Oakland, and Salt Lake. And those seven places have developed initiatives, large-scale initiatives where most or all of their schools are community schools. So I think that what your listeners will find when our book comes out, and our book is called The Community Schools Revolution, Wonderful. I think when the book comes out, what people will find is that community schools is an idea whose time has come. Yes. Well, I certainly agree. And I, I think it's a it's a title of honor, right, to be for, referred to as an elder. I think of you all, each of you, those names that you mentioned are all powerhouses and architects of the current community schools movement. When we refer to the community schools movement, everyone, what we're talking about is that we do want to see that more and more schools around the country take on this strategy of blending resources and opportunities together for kids because we know that it improves children's, not just their outcomes, but what's so exciting about community schools is that they change children's experience. Jane, you know, when we think about that too, I know when I first visited my first community school in, in New York at your invitation, I saw what you've talked about in terms of the kids are happy and, you know, there are, there's so much going on in the school. And it, it opened my eyes to, to what the school, what a community school can be. So grateful for that. And those of us who are, as I am, big proponents of community schools recognize that it takes take some time to get there. I'm very proud to say that the NEA Foundation, with the support of our board, has begun to invest in the development of community schools in parts of the country where, unfortunately, they are grossly underrepresented. And we have done that, as you so well know, Jane, because we believe that community schools also contribute directly to an equity strategy and bringing greater equity, excellence, and opportunity to areas that and children that might otherwise be underserved. I know that you share in that vision, and I was wondering if you might talk a little bit about, as a board member of the NEA Foundation, why you supported that, that, that Southern work. I have become aware of the big gap in community schools development in the Deep South. The Coalition for Community Schools has mapped nationally where the community schools exist. And every year when I would look at that map, I would see, and a lot of other people would see, this big gaping hole in the Deep South. And 
as someone who was working nationally to promote community schools, I was the director of the National Center for Community Schools for 18 years. And I never saw the dial moving in that part of the country until the NEA Foundation decided to take this on. So I'm, I've been a vocal advocate on the board as well as at, when I speak around the country to, to give the NEA Foundation a lot of credit for taking on a challenge that apparently no one else was willing to take on. Well, I really appreciate that, though, though I want to also say to our audience, you know, we don't normally do what I guess you might refer to as inside baseball on these podcasts, but I can't help but talk about the work of the NEA Foundation, which does host the Up Close podcast. And as Jane has just said, is a strong supporter of the development of community schools alongside many partners, some of whom Jane has mentioned the Coalition for Community Schools, certainly the NEA, which has a major national initiative. And there are so many others, the National Center for Community Schools Technical Assistance Center that Jane used to direct in New York. And we are being applauded along as we do this work. But at the same time, a critical aspect in doing it and to encourage others around the country A critical aspect of doing the work there and everywhere really is a commitment to capacity building. And when I talk with folks about this strategy and how it brings change to children's lives, I'm always careful to underscore that typically as a school becomes a community school, and here we're talking about public schools that are taking on this strategy to bring new resources and opportunities to kids. But when we talk about that, we also want to ensure that that we're saying there there usually is a need for some parallel capacity building with that commitment, that financial commitment. So for those, again, who may be unfamiliar, Jane, with what that means, that we have this commitment, can you talk about what you have seen when that capacity building does and does not happen? Sure, absolutely. My work for 18 years was about capacity building, and I have the great privilege of traveling all across the country to help people who wanted to start implementing this strategy. And what we found is that people can benefit greatly from coaching, from training, from seeing videos of successful community schools having printed materials that give them a step to st- a step by step approach to moving through the stages of development of a community school i really appreciated what pedro nagara said in the last up close podcast when he said that many educators have not had a chance to observe good practice and i think in the work that is true in a lot of the work of of school improvement, but it's definitely true in the work of community schools. And so at Children's Aid and the National Center for Community Schools, we hosted hundreds, hundreds of study visits every year. People came to see our work on the ground and to talk to the practitioners who were doing the work the principals and the school nurses and the community school directors and the after-school program directors and the people who ran the school-based health centers. And that learning experience of being able to really see, observe good practice, and I say kick the tires, you know, talk to the people who are doing the work. I think there's no substitute for that part of capacity building. So to me, capacity building is a whole array of professional development opportunities that are tailored, tailored to the needs of the people who are doing the work because everybody's starting at a different point. But the capacity building work always starts with the goals that people are trying to achieve in their local communities. It's not our goals at the National Center. It's your goals. And we're going to walk the journey with you to help you achieve those goals. I really like you describing it as walking the journey with you, because we know that all community schools look slightly different in that they are intended to be responsive to the distinct needs, resources, assets, opportunities in any individual community. 
And so there's not this, you know, a model that those who are advancing community schools hope is adopted across all schools, but rather that every community comes together to look afresh at how it is going to leverage those assets and opportunities to improve kids' educational experience and outcomes. Well, I think the best evidence we have is contained in a 2017 study conducted by the Learning Policy Institute and the National Education Policy Center. I'm so grateful to our colleagues at those two organizations because they examined 143 evaluations of community schools, and they found strong evidence that the strategy works, both by improving academic achievement and by improving on a a wide array of non-academic outcomes, things like children's well-being and their health or their parents' engagement in their education. Another really important study that came after the 2017 study is a a study conducted by RAND, and Mm. they did an evaluation of the largest community school initiative in the country, that is the New York City Community Schools Initiative. And they documented a host of positive outcomes, including improvements in academic achievement and graduation rates and reductions in chronic absence. So we are seeing more and more evidence coming out of the field. I think you can't argue with 143 evaluations. And so I think that's the single best source of the evidence right now. Mm. And where do you see these community schools having the greatest impact then, Jane? And why do you think those schools that have the greatest impact have have excelled above others? I think the initiatives that have excelled have been careful to learn from the experience of others in the field. Mm -hmm. I think that, I mean, the New York City Initiative is a great example where they actually, the National Center worked with New York City to try to learn from the experiences of other initiatives that had gone to scale before New York City adopted this strategy. And so we helped them look at Chicago and Tulsa and Portland, Oregon. I think there were four or five places and they they needed, New York wanted to learn not only how to implement one community school, but how to build an entire system of community schools. New York City now has 416 community schools in its initiative. Wow. So they built a substantial infrastructure to support the work on the ground. And that is something that we have learned from the system building work that's gone on all over the country, that you need to support that work at the district level and you need support from outside. And the role of private philanthropy in this work cannot be downplayed at all. I think that we've seen so many public-private partnerships. You can't do this work without public resources, without reallocating public resources. But it really helps also to have private philanthropy in the mix. You know, something that I've experienced is that, you know, a lot of times now a superintendent, a principal, a visionary teacher will get excited about the community school strategy, want to see it brought to a community, but the rest of the community has never heard about community schools. And there are so many different models and approaches to community schools right now. And sometimes some reticence. I faced a little bit of this in some uh, parts of the areas where we're doing this work ourselves, where folks said, well, what type of a school is this? And I would say, it's a public school. We're looking together at this strategy of bringing more resources into the school. But anyway, what I wanted to ask you is that if you put yourself in the position of a parent who's hearing my school is going to become a community school. Put yourself in the position of the broader community hearing that. What can folks expect? What, are the, what, will, they, what will that mean? What, what typically happens once it's determined, let's make a school a community school? 
Well, I will say this. In my own experience, I'll start there. I'll say more uh, uh, more than that. But I remember the first community school I visited when I was at the Wallace Foundation, and I had an opportunity to visit a children's aid community school. Mm -hmm. And I was standing in the foyer of that school, and I noticed two things. One was that there were a lot more adults around than I was used to seeing in the schools I had been visiting. Mm -hmm. The second thing I noticed was that the children were happy. Mm. And I thought those were very good signs. And I think that when community resources, people from different organizations become involved in community schools, there are more adults around because you have the after-school staff. Often the after-school staff include people from the community who look like the children, who are, you know, as diverse as the student bodies. You will see doctors, nurses, social workers. You will see more parents in the school because you'll have a family resource center. So I think that what I saw in my first community school is something that people can expect to see. Another thing I would say is that having visited thousands of schools in my career, I can tell you that you can sense the culture of a school when you walk through the front door. Absolutely. Sometimes before you get in the front door. And community schools are happy. They tend to be happy places. Mm -hmm. They tend to be <laughs> High energy and yet calm and orderly. So there's almost a juxtaposition of qualities. But I think that the, the culture and climate of the school have a, lot, have a lot to do with whether it's a good school and whether it's a good community school. And that you just said you've seen thousands of these schools now, and I know not only in the U.S., but around the world. So I can't help but ask you, Jane, what's your favorite community school story? Well, believe me, I have plenty, but I, I think my favorite community school story goes back to the early 2000s when I had just joined the staff at Children's Aid, and I got a phone call from Joy Dreyfus. Now, Sarah, you know who Joy Dreyfus was, but yeah. I will explain to our listening audience that Joy Dreyfus, who died in 2005, was, is considered the godmother of this generation of community schools. She wrote a wonderful book in 1994 called Full Service School, yeah. and it had a big impact on a lot of us. So when Joy Dreyfus calls you, you listen, right? So she said, Jane, I... I have somebody I want to bring for a study visit. And I said, sure, who is it? And she said, well, he's a member of Congress. He's kind of well-known. I said, go on. She said, his name is Steny Hoyer. <laughs> now, I knew who Steny Hoyer was. He's now the House Majority Leader. I think he actually was back then as well. And so, of course, I said yes. And they came for a visit to one of our schools. And they visited classrooms and they talked with students and teachers and they examined all of the student support services like the school-based health center and the dental clinic. And they spent time in the parent resource center and talked with a largely Dominican group of mothers and fathers. And as the visit was winding down, Representative Hoyer said, Okay, Jane, I like what you're doing here, but there's something I don't understand. And I said, what's that? He said, why are you putting all of these resources into a middle-class school? And I knew right then that we could gain his support. So I said, Mr. Hoyer, what makes you think this is a middle-class school? And I said, Representative Hoyer, you are in one of the lowest income schools in New York City. Nearly all of the students you saw qualify for free or reduced price lunch. And then to close the deal, I said, but this is what kids look like when their needs are met. Mm. 
He became a convert that day and went on to put the initial funding for full-service schools into the federal budget. That was $5 million at that point, and it stayed at $5 million for many years. And just this year, it has risen, as you know, yes. to $68 million because we have the evidence that this strategy works. And we are so grateful that the Biden administration has caught the vision and is such a strong supporter of full-service community schools to the extent, as you've just said, Jane, we're all celebrating this phenomenal increase in support for community schools to $68 million. What do you think this particular investment in community schools is going to mean for the movement at this time? I, I think it's going to mean a lot. I, it's... The money certainly helps, although this money is going to leverage other money. It's not that it's going to pay for X number of additional services. Yes, it will do some of that, but it will also leverage the allocation of public, other public and private dollars. I think it also is having the federal support at this level is a kind of imprimatur from the federal government that this is now a preferred reform strategy, this mm -hmm. comprehensive, holistic strategy. That is worth the price of admission, I, I would say. I think having the federal government endorse that, they wouldn't say that, but uh, the imprimatur really comes from the allocation of the resources and putting staff time into and, and and putting the bully pulpit, Secretary Cardona's bully pulpit, is some of that time is being allocated to full-service community schools. And that is all to the good. Because I think COVID has caused a re-examination of what we need to do in our schools to be more equitable to be more just and to be more responsive. All you need to do is read about the mental health challenges caused by COVID, and you know that schools cannot do it by themselves. They need partners who have expertise that can build on the expertise that they have, which is great expertise, but it's not everything. So I think COVID has really put a spotlight on why we need to think about our schools in a very different way. Yeah, one of the things that I will often say when people maybe are reticent at first about what are these community schools, you know, and what is it going to mean that all these folks come into the school? Uh, you talked about, the, you know, now you see this incredible increase of adults doing all kinds of exciting things in the school. But at, at first blush, that idea of all this stuff happening in the school can be a little overwhelming. Right. It's only when folks see that, all right, now that because you have vision care or dental care in a school, right, and now a student who didn't even know that he or she had a vision problem gets glasses and someone who had a toothache now has access to a dentist, the teachers begin to see, the educators see that now they can focus on teaching. And because the student's needs are met, the student can focus on learning. And th that single revelation I have found has changed the hearts and minds of a lot of educators to the point where I know some of the early resistors when I was doing the work initially in an, an area became our strongest supporters because they saw how it revolutionized not just the children's experience, but the educators' experience as well, and then the broader community as the work grew. But there are yet misperceptions, right, right. about community there schools. Are. And of course there are, because there's so much happening in the field of education right now. And, you know, even you talk about, and I've just mentioned the Biden administration's tremendous support for community schools, which of course we all greatly appreciate. But the truth is community schools have always enjoyed broad bipartisan support. I mean, really, it's one of the strengths that we have in advocating for the furtherance of community schools throughout the nation is that they do enjoy bipartisan support. We've seen this in the South. But yet these 
the, you know, various misperceptions can persist. We try to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth on this show. Jane, so would you talk a little bit about some of the misperceptions you've encountered about community schools and how you counter those? Yeah, sure. I think the biggest misconception that I hear is that some people use the term community schools to refer only to the additional services. They talk about the school and the community school. Mm -hmm. And I say, no, 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 it's the school is a community school. The school is made up of the core instructional program and known amount of mental health services can compensate if you don't have a good instructional say program, that. right? Say so, that. right. So the the instructional program is part of the community school. The family and community engagement is part of the community school. The expanded learning opportunities are part of the community school. The integrated student supports are part of the community school. And the collaborative leadership is part of the community school. We would be remiss, Sarah, if we did not mention that Almost all community schools have a leadership role that is played by a community school director or coordinator yes, yes. who partners with the principals. Another problem that I've seen in schools around the country is when they don't have a coordinating function. Mm -hmm. They might have 75 partners, but, the part, but they may end up with a Christmas tree with lots of ornaments, but they don't have everybody rowing in the same direction, working on the same set of goals. And so the integration of the different core components of the community school are what distinguishes a community school from a school with a bunch of partners. Mm -hmm. I often, I love that you said that because I, I, personally um someone who I always cringe when I hear the term sorry everyone but wrap around services because Cran -y. Cran -y. you know when we talk about wrap around services in schools we're talking about co-locating a whole bunch of stuff in a school and we know that the research right does indicates that that can make some difference but if you really want to see a powerful difference in a school it's when all this the supports and resources and opportunities, you, you talked about rowing in the same direction. All those supports and opportunities are integrated into one comprehensive whole. I am so appreciative that you have raised that point, Jane. Um, uh, Sarah, it, I want to say one other thing about wraparound services. I'm glad you raised that point. I have always felt that that language was about fixing kids. It just smacks of that. Mm -hmm. And I don't that's why I don't like that language. This is not about fixing kids so that they're ready to learn. This is about supporting students so they have opportunities to learn. And so I, I would love to see us get rid of the wraparound language because I think it it connotes some things that are much less effective than what we're talking about with the community school strategy. Mm -hmm. You know, Jane, something else I'd like to ask you about. In every one of our broadcasts, we raise that everyone can contribute to students' improved educational experience and outcomes. It's not just a domain of educators. It's, it's really a whole community's responsibility, I would say, yeah. but perhaps more charitably, opportunity. So when we talk about the community school strategy with that mindset, what do you think that can mean? I think it can mean several things. Certainly there are opportunities to volunteer in schools, but there are opportunities to support bond issues when they come up for passage. There are opportunities to give back your tax rebate. We get a tax rebate in New York State that I don't like. It's called the star rebate, and it's for senior citizens. And it takes money out of the school budget. I don't like that at all. I think we can inform ourselves about what's going on in our communities. And I think, 
I invite people to go visit their local school and find out what they can do to support the school. And I have to say, I think that educators have been doing a great job of advocating for community schools. I'm so grateful to the NEA as well as to the AFT for their support of community schools at the federal level. Their advocacy means a lot because teachers can speak with the clearest of voices about the unmet needs of children and families in their school. They have great authority when they speak about the needs of children and families. And I think that educators have been among the strongest supporters of community schools. But all citizens have a role to play in supporting their public schools and in advocating for community schools. In New York City, the Coalition for Educational Justice, which is a consortium of parents, are really the people without whom we would not have 416 community schools in New York City. Now, lots of people contributed to the success of that work, but without the political pressure brought by parents, we would not be where we are in New York City today. So, Jane, one of the things that's on everyone's mind right now, um, although this might seem a little bit of a left turn, but very prominently right now, we're all concerned about the level of, of uh, violence and gun safety issues in schools. And I know I recently was asked, so I'd like to pitch the question to you. What would the community school strategy possibly bring to a community as it wrestles with the, you know, the need to give heightened attention to gun safety and safety in schools? Well, I don't I don't feel like that's a left turn at all. I think that concerns about safety have been central to the work that I have observed in community schools across the country. And part of it is that community schools are predicated on relationships. Mm -hmm. So in community schools, staff take the time to know who is coming in and out of the building. And safety precautions are baked into the DNA of community schools through clear procedures that are consistently applied. And I'm talking about not just applied by school staff, but by the partner organizations who are in the school. So I know from my experience at Children's Aid that our staff were always involved in all the fire drills, all the safety drills. It's part of the work. It's part of the life in the school to be attuned to safety. But another point that I'll make is that community schools, because they pay a lot of attention to mental health, they have the capacity and the skills to identify students who may be experiencing anxiety, depression, suicidal ideation, and some of the experiences that we've understood have plagued the young people who have become perpetrators. So I think school safety depends on paying attention to the people who are in the school as well as to the people who are coming in from the outside. And I think it has to be on everyone's mind all the time. If relationships are central to what you're working on, I think you have a much greater chance of having a safe school. Wonderful, wonderful. You know, I've uh, something that just jumped off the page to me, you talked about collaborative leadership. And more often, I think what we see, the truth be told, is competitive leadership. So collaborative leadership as one of the necessary elements of community schools seems to be possibly in some context a steep hill. What do you think contributes most to that change? If that's going to be one of the pillars of a community school, how do you get there? I think you get there by listening and by modeling behavior that is collaborative. And it starts with the principal. 
principals who have an inclusive leadership style, who are willing to share the leadership with their teachers and with their partners and with their parents, have been much more successful. We know that from tons and tons of research. There used to be in the professional literature a description of some principles, a style of principal leadership called the one-man band. And we know that that is less effective than the principal leadership with an inclusive style. But I think everybody needs to model that leadership. And I think that it's more likely to happen when all of the partners have a hand in creating the vision and when all of the partners understand that they are working toward the same goals, Mm -hmm. that they're accountable for the same goals. Mm -hmm. At the NEA Foundation, we also talk about community schools as a strategy for advancing educational justice. And this is one of the primary reasons that we invest in the community schools, especially in those areas under, under-resourced in this country. So I'd just be interested from your personal perspective and experience and all that you have observed and learned as you've helped to design and implement the community school strategy around the world, frankly, when you hear, yep, this is a tool for advancing educational justice, what, what does that mean to you, Jane? I think equity and justice are at the heart of the community school strategy, because this strategy is all about increasing opportunities for success by expanding access to needed resources. Those resources are human and financial. They're public and private. They're education and non-education resources. But we know that we do not have an equitable public education system in this country. We know that because we rely on property taxes as the basis for the financing of our schools, we have baked inequity into the very foundations of our school system. Mm -hmm. The community school strategy is trying to counter that. We're also supporting lawsuits around fiscal equity, but we are taking active steps to increase the amount of resources going into our public schools by reallocating resources, by rethinking who's partnering with whom, and by working on a consistent vision and a consistent set of goals. That's a fabulous soundbite. We're going to we're going to slice that as our commercial for this program. <laughs> well, thank you Jane again for everyone. I cannot tell you how much Jane Quinn, Dr. Jane Quinn has contributed to this strategy that is changing the experience and the outcomes of children in public schools across this nation and the world. We have been very privileged to have Jane with us today. Jane, thank you for sharing your heart, your experience, your research, your knowledge, all that you've learned and observed over the years. I hope that you will come back someday and talk with us further on the Up Close podcast. Everyone, thank you so much for listening. As always, I want to invite you to subscribe to the Up Close podcast if you like what you've heard today and want to stay in touch with and up close with thought leaders and educators who around the country are doing phenomenal work, then the Up Close podcast is the place for you. Thank you for tuning in today. We'll see you next time.